Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us in our um, third session. I am Dr. Tonmu Itanayok. I'm a molecular biologist and I'm working in Germany. Um, <clears throat> today, I have a student representative along with me. Uh, let's welcome Taj. Hello, Taj. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Um, Taj, can you give us a little bit of introduction, what you were studying at or your location? Can you tell us a bit about you? Uh, yes, I am uh, Taj Gongopadhyay. I mm -hmm. uh, have just passed class 12 from Vivekananda Mission School. Um, I have studied from the ISC curriculum. Right. And uh, even though I'm from the humanities field, I am still very much interested about uh, this wildlife biology and conservation. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I'm uh, looking to uh, pursue my career in uh, mass communication and videography. Um, right. Yeah, that's that's all about me. Okay, so Taj, are you excited to invite our uh, guest of the day? <laughs> yes, I'm very excited. Okay, so today we have a very interesting personality with us who have uh, many stories in his bag. Um, some are fun, some are adventurous, some even be might a little bit scary. Um, the stories cover Himalayan mountain ranges to central uh, Asian high altitude landscapes. Uh, there are snow leopards, red foxes, mountain ibex, Ladakh reels, and whatnot. Um, Unfortunately, many of these rare and beautiful species are on the verge of extinction. And uh, it's on us to take a step forward and at least try to be aware on our surrounding wildlife um, and its conservation. How to do that? Um, listen from the expert. Let's welcome Dr. Obhishek Ghoshal, um, who is working at the moment as a conservation ecolo ecologist in the United Nations Development Program in India, um, and uh, earned his PhD in uh, wildlife science, uh, especially focusing on snow leopard. So let's welcome Dr. Obhishek Ghoshal. Hi, Obhishek. Hi. Thank Good you evening. for joining us. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much for inviting me on this session. Really excited. A huge thanks again. Um, so first thing first, Abhishek, like even I am from the uh, even after being from the biological science field, it's not clear to me as well that what you actually do in your regular office day. Like, um, does office means a four world compartment to you, or is it some of us might imagine that you are sitting in a tent in the middle of a jungle holding a telescope <laughs> in your hand? Like, is it something cool like that, or is it entirely different? What would you say? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's a fortunately it was a mixture of uh, the two. Uh, so I did have a uh, four world office space as well uh, in Mysore, Bangalore, and Dehradun, where I used to work with uh, Nature Conservation Foundation and Wildlife Institute of India. Uh, however, uh, my uh, research field, as you uh, mentioned yourself, uh, focused on. Uh, High altitude uh, wildlife species, yes. and then uh, nearly uh, half of the year uh, right. in Himalayas, in the states of Himachal Pradesh, Ladakh, mm -hmm. and later on during my postdoctorate uh, in Central Asia. So there, uh, yes, uh, at times my uh, office looked like a three percent tent or four percent tent, and okay. uh, we did uh, used to spend a lot of time. Uh, along with uh, my colleagues, uh, researchers, yeah. uh, also uh, local people in the uh, yeah. villages we used to work yeah. with, we used to hire uh, people from there and train them and work with us yeah. uh, as people uh, in that landscape. So, so is, it, uh, is it right to say that you have to train also the local people and also kind of need to interact with them a lot on your daily uh, work life agenda? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. Because, uh, for example, if uh, say somebody is interested in uh, say plants of a particular yes. area uh, of any area in that sense, mm -hmm. and not uh, the mountains, so you need to sort of uh, go into that area, talk to the local people, identify a few persons mm -hmm. who are uh, interested in that subject, and there will be definitely wherever you go, uh, how much ever. Uh, modernized our societies uh, uh, continue yeah. to become. 
there will be people who are very knowledgeable about the natural history of that area. They would know, a few people would know exactly what plants are out there, what each plants can be used for, uh, what mm -hmm. uh, birds are there, what animals are there, uh, what are their characteristics. So we used to basically identify uh, some of those uh, people uh, from the villages, young persons to uh, say middle-aged people. Mm -hmm. and then uh, get them on board. Uh, often we used to hire them as uh, field assistants, field coordinators. Mm -hmm. Even we trained them on uh, things like, uh, say, GPS tracking. Uh, like right. the team with, with with whom I used to work with, they knew how to basically track a location. So you give them mm -hmm. coordinates, you give them a GPS machine, global positioning mm -hmm. machine, and they can exactly walk two, three, four, five kilometers and take you to that particular location. They were that well trained. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we did used to interact a lot with the local people. I, in fact, myself stayed with the local people for a long, long time right. and uh, sort of uh, developed relationships like uh, families uh, okay. with the local people there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, great. Very interesting. So um, what are some of the things that you actually do in the field as part of um, uh, research and conservation? What would you say? Right. So, uh, if you can uh, kindly start playing the uh, yeah. photos yeah. that I have shared. Uh, so, I would just uh, show some of the areas in which I uh, used to work. Right. Just keep it. Sure, uh, sure. Can you see it now? It's loading, yeah. <clears throat> so, okay. uh, in, uh, places like this, uh, this is... Okay. Uh, in, this is called Spiti area uh, right. in Natal Pradesh. So it's in Lahul and Spiti district. Many people, even people in my, uh, you know, in my friend circle and my family, mm -hmm. uh, thought of visiting this place for the first time. Asked me in which country is this, and after seeing photos, uh, like this, yes. yeah. yeah, many people ask, is this in India? Do we have places like this in India? <laughs> so, yeah, right. yeah. So these places are extremely remote, and uh, some of the questions that I was pursuing were related mm -hmm. uh, ecology of uh, species like uh, the red fox. Can you uh, kindly try and make yeah. it uh, clean? To the it red fox you were talking about, so yes. Yeah. So uh, I was saying if you could uh, make this full screen, the presentation. Uh, if I could what? Full screen. Uh, Full screen it is full screen to me actually but is it oh, okay no? okay Might be. Uh, no, not yet. now mm, not okay yet. it won't be full screen full screen okay. in the broadcast no. we will be in the panel no. sorry for that sure yeah. Sure, sure. I so, yeah. so I will so go I, to the uh, red fox yeah. slide. So I was working on species like uh, red fox, which are uh, yes. uh, pretty common. And even in the plain lands, there are uh, jungle fox, uh, which are mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, Indian fox, uh, basically, which are quite common in the plain lands. So if you go to any town village, you can see the species. It's the same species, basically, mm -hmm. uh, that are found in the high altitude as well. And these are very uh, sort of... Uh, mm. uh, you know, dependent on uh, human uh, subsidies like garbage uh, and whatever uh, you know, remains of carcasses are there in the villages. Yes. So for, mm -hmm. during winter when the entire landscape is uh, covered with a, under a thick cloak of uh, snow, uh, mm -hmm. reds usually come very near to villages. They spend a lot of time in villages and in villages for yes. food. And, yeah. So one of the questions that I was pursuing is how basically uh, human subsidies are supporting red fox populations in this particular area and I what see. could be factors that are impacting their uh, distribution and population. So one of the interesting things that we found was that uh, there were also dogs uh, present in the area, general okay. street dogs or village dogs. So okay. mm -hmm. also dependent on the same resource and because two species, very similar species are, uh, yeah. when they are dependent on the same resource, the yeah. more Powerful or the more uh, mm -hmm. uh, pack living uh, species, yes. it's supposed to outcompete the relatively weaker species. So, right. we found mm -hmm. that as village sizes increased, uh, the abundance and uh, the densities of uh, species like red fox gradually increased, but then tipped mm -hmm. 
uh, when uh, dog population started increasing with the human substitute. So basically, uh, even if you keep on increasing the food source mm -hmm. uh, for species like red cross, it will not continue to benefit that particular species mm -hmm. as we. So okay. that's mm -hmm. one of the study species. And then uh, for my PhD, I uh, looked at uh, large scale distribution patterns of uh, small leopards. So basically, okay. arrow, uh, species like small leopards occur. Uh, where all its uh, prey species occur, like the baral, blue sheep, and the Himalayan ibex. So, uh, for that, if you could uh, kindly go to the first, uh, second slide. Mm -hmm. The second slide showing the landscape. This one, right? Mm, it's not changing, in my view. Uh, which one? Can you adjust the second, the second, the second slide? Yeah, second yeah. size to so, AMC, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, now it is visible, yeah. yeah. So this is, uh, for example, in uh, Ladakh, this is the Indus River. So places like Spiti River Valley and uh, uh, yeah. Indus Valley in Ladakh, these are supposedly very good habitats of small okay. uh, uh Then if you could go to the third slide, we used to put basically camera traps. Uh, I see, okay. These are remotely sensed uh, cameras which are placed in uh, columns like this and whenever anything is moving in between it has movement sensors as well as heat sensors mm. and okay. basically click the photographs of the flanks of the animal. I see, uh, okay. Yeah. If could so they, the they must be, snow leopard must be very rare to have a sight of them, right? It is, yeah, absolutely. after absolutely. months of trial, probably we got a glimpse like that, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and it's often uh, very difficult to be seen, even if it might be present uh, in your vicinity because of its uh, wonderful uh, camouflage. Mm -hmm. The color of the yeah. it mixes exactly. with the background so well, and it is one of the most right. uh, mm -hmm. sophisticated uh, evolutionary adaptation for small birds, uh, which makes it very difficult to be seen not just by us but also yeah. by its uh, prey species. So it right. helps basically go in near. That or camouflaging effects yeah, very exactly. well adapted, right? So okay. it helps them to go yeah. near to their prey species mm -hmm. and uh, help them in uh, help help them in preying upon their prey species. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it depends. Yeah, basically, what sort of question uh, a scientist or a researcher is asking? Yes. Uh, so we basically go out, uh, look for signs of small leopards like pug marks, like. Yeah. Uh, trail marks, their mm -hmm. scents marks, and we used to put cameras out there uh, for yeah. uh, taking their photographs in a non invasive manner. Yeah. We used mm -hmm. to sample for vegetation uh, using quadrat methods. So you basically put in a mm -hmm. particular one meter by one meter or two by two meter uh, okay. frame and count the number of plant species that you see in that. So mm -hmm. basically, we used to take uh, an account of uh, what that area is like ecologically, what all species of animals and plants are there. Yes. Then based on analysis of that particular data, we used to look at patterns uh, that we expected. Yeah. So mm -hmm. okay. usually that's how my field day is used to. Okay. Yeah. So uh, actually, um, there are some questions that uh, Taj has been asking to me since last few days, uh, since you know that we'll be coming here today in today's session. So let's give the floor to Taj actually. And Taj, this is your opportunity. So you can ask away. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, first, uh, I want to ask that, uh, did you actually see a snow leopard? I did. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, four times uh, during my eight years of uh, uh, field work uh, from my master's in 2000, master's dissertation work in 2011 till uh, 2018, uh, till I finished my postdoc. And uh, can you uh, share some interesting stories with us about your field work? Absolutely. So uh, if you uh, look into the photographs that I have shared, uh, I think the third or fourth one is uh, a wonderful uh, camera trap photo that we had got uh, of small leopards uh, sitting inside a particular cave. So uh, it happened that uh, we uh, were walking the previous one, the third scene. The third one, just a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here, basically, what happened? Uh, so the photo itself is 
I think uh, one of the best uh, images that have been captured uh, through Snow Leopard uh, globally and this photo has been acclaimed a lot. Uh, it was used by Nat Geo, it was used by BBC, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically what happened on this uh, particular day, our team, uh, they were walking along this particular trail and uh, when we see an overhang like this, so this particular feature that you see, it's sort of a, you know, while you're walking, so you see a cave sort of a thing mm -hmm. like this. And usually these uh, rock surfaces are uh, uh, very convenient for snow leopards to put their tails up like this and put a spring. So that's how basically snow leopards mark their territory. And uh, we found a lot of uh, scent spray on this particular site. And uh, we thought that it would be a, a good site to put in uh, some camera traps. And uh, so one evening, uh, this particular camera trap that you are seeing the photo of, uh, it was placed there. And we moved on, we, we were putting camera traps across a large area. And then when we retrieved the photos, uh, so usually all these photos, they come with a date stamp, time stamp, uh, temperature, everything is written on uh, uh, the photographs uh, when we retrieve it. So after two, two and a half weeks, when we went back to check up on, we usually take out the microchip, uh, the data card, and replace it with another one because it keeps on taking photographs and the data cards, they keep on getting filled. So when we took out that particular uh, uh, chip from this uh, uh, camera truck, we saw that the same night, uh, the same evening we were there, later in the night, uh, these two individuals and along with them, another three individuals had walked right across you know this particular path yeah. and they again sprayed on the site that we had uh, checked upon and uh, ultimately mm -hmm. had uh, these two uh, individuals uh, getting settled down in this okay. cave and uh, right, giving right. wonderful photos. Yeah. So it was really exciting for us because uh, these are extremely difficult areas to reach. Yeah. Exactly. Very dangerous uh, cliff, you know, along we have to walk along cliffs. We have to be really careful because we have been probably yeah. Yeah. like exactly. okay, thousand or fifteen hundred feet above uh, the gorge. So uh, it was really uh, exciting to see that the exact trail that we had used and we had predicted the smaller boats also ended up using uh, that yeah. particular. So a lot of anticipation also goes in the way, huh? To to anticipate the yeah. trail which they might be taking. I mean, you have to follow yeah. your hunch at times, no? Yeah, exactly. And it depends on the skills of the team members who are serving yeah. that particular area because you really have to know uh, what kind of areas uh, uh, smaller birds uh, use for yes. putting different types of markings. Right. So, yeah. You come across a pavmark trail, I mean, that's uh, you are very lucky, but otherwise, usually, what we find are scrape. So, basically, when they urinate or they drop uh, their feces, yeah. they usually, with their two paws, they make a sort of uh, you know, they remove the yeah, okay. mm -hmm. bit, and that we call scrape mark. So, okay. those things mm -hmm. to be skilled to identify uh, these sort of scent marks, you have to be uh, skilled to identify. Right. So, that. Uh, fine-tuned uh, naturalist skill has to be there and then of course uh, one has to place the camera there are technicalities with mm. the camera putting the camera in the right angle at the right height uh, so so yeah so you need, to think, you need to train yourself to think like a smaller bird and uh, you know mm -hmm. then you get the best results out of it Okay, that's really cool. So, um, okay. a lot of lot of um, uh, school students and college students are actually watching us right now. So, uh, maybe I would like to ask you the most important question, the relevant question: that why would someone take up wildlife biology and conservation as a um, as as a profession? Right. Uh, so I can't speak for everyone, <laughs> but <laughs> I'll but I but I'll speak for myself. So. It's a uh, passion driven. Uh, mm. it, uh, uh, it, I, I felt that uh, I'm someone who would like to spend my life, uh, you know, or, or build up a career uh, by being able to spend time in these landscapes. Uh, okay. By spending, I wanted to spend time by observing these uh, species. I wanted to learn more in a scientific manner about these species, mm -hmm. the kind of 
uh, evolutionary adaptations these species have developed to be able to survive in some of the most inhospitable uh, areas of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, if you think about it in a broad manner, uh, the Himalayas overall, uh, for a general person, it might be a wonderful tourist destination, it might be a, uh, you know, a very calming uh, sort of effect on many people it does. Uh, mm -hmm. People go yoga, people go for, uh, say, recovering uh, from some illness. But uh, on a more technical uh, aspect, the Himalayas basically is the reason why the Indian subcontinent is mm -hmm. the uh, In terms of its weather conditions, in terms of its agricultural productivity, mm -hmm. in terms of its capacity to support uh, nearly, say, 20-25% of the global population mm -hmm. because of the water that it provides. Mm -hmm. uh, just to the Indian subcontinent, but on the northern side, uh, to the Tibetan Plateau, to China, uh, rivers flowing into the Central Asia. So overall, uh, the Himalayas are responsible for shaping the monsoon patterns in our country, which makes our country uh, the way it is, the, yeah. the way it is visible and highly productive. Uh, so basically, my own uh, uh, you know, passion for uh, this field and also uh, the need to basically learn and apply uh, the science mm -hmm. to inform the, uh, you know, the, the conservation of these areas because ultimately if you look at any landscape, not just the Himalayas, mm -hmm. gradually over, the, over thousands and thousands of years of uh, changing uh, land use patterns, yeah. changing urbanization patterns, we have been uh, you know, destroying or uh, you know, we have been yeah. removing a lot of uh, green cover from the face of the earth. We have been changing the natural ecosystems a lot. Yeah. And the result is in front of everyone. It is uh, leading obvious that uh, yeah. you know, disastrous uh, impacts of uh, climate change is impacting yeah. us in yeah. Bombay. Already. I actually so it's a combination. To, uh, yeah. to the school students about this, what you were just talking about on um, this uh, climate change and this conservation and how they see it as an uh, grave issue and what's their approach right. towards it. Uh, so I will go to that very quickly. But before that, I mean, sure. Taj was about to, uh, um, Taj wanted to ask you some school level questions. So Taj, sure. would you like to ask? Um, yeah. First, I think uh, we have a question uh, from the audience uh, asking that, did you camp for weeks in a small leopard country to capture these shots? Uh, so, uh, we did uh, end up spending nearly, uh, say at least for my case, uh, I nearly spent six months of my uh, every year uh, during 2011 to 2018 uh, in these areas. And uh, so, we used to have a base camp sort of thing in a village, uh, in, a, in one of the major villages. And then we used to camp out. Uh, we used to get inside the valleys, deep inside the valleys okay. and camp. Mm -hmm. So at a, at, time, uh, at a time, we would spend say two, two and a half weeks, three weeks uh, mm -hmm. away from the villages. So at least say eight, 10 kilometers away from the villages, camping okay. there for uh, two, three weeks and uh, collecting all sorts of data. and. Right. Uh, the photos that you saw, those were from uh, camera traps. Uh, mm. that not, uh, yes. Taken by the yeah. camera. Uh, there are people uh, who indeed uh, spend uh, nights after nights or days after days uh, to capture uh, snow leopard photographs. This kind of so, one glimpse of snow leopards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are there are uh, there are uh, uh, say uh, uh, photographers, professional photographers working yeah. with uh, uh, different uh, media houses like uh, yes. Maxi planet BBC who are uh, spending huge amount of time in these areas and not just these areas but also, also in other in forest areas, other coastal areas. They depending on what species yeah. they are working on, right? Exactly. So this is the territory. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, I wanted to ask something, uh, talking specifically about uh, snow leopards, are they a big danger to humans? So, uh, Till date, uh, there are no recorded instances of uh, a snow leopard attacking. Uh, but 
there are multiple instances when uh, smaller birds attack livestock, sheep, goat, uh, inside the village. So, particularly if uh, the sheep, goats are kept, uh, kept uh, inside an unguarded coral pen, uh, okay. often it happens uh, a small leopard might get in, inside that particular coral pen and kill a lot of uh, sheep and goat. Uh, however, uh, there have been instances when uh, the forest department people or assisted by the, supported by the local people, they have uh, carefully uh, uh, taking due protection and everything, they have shifted uh, the small leopard uh, you know, to a safe location away from the village and uh, the small leopard has walked away uh, casually uh, away from the village. Uh, so there, have been, uh, there hasn't been any instance of uh, small leopards attacking humans, so uh, technically uh, they are very safe animals to be uh, okay. uh, But there are, uh, there's an interesting twist to that, so on the contrary, uh, village dogs are a danger to small leopards as well because a uh, pack of say four or five dogs yeah. can yeah. kill a small leopard. And uh, it, uh, there have been lots of instances in India and in China. Uh, mm -hmm. In uh, uh, when we have seen video clips of uh, say four or five dogs attacking a small leopard, chasing a small leopard. Yes, uh, yeah, exactly. So, so feral dogs, uh, village dogs have become a very big threat. Popular yeah. threat, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay uh, I, on, uh, to your, uh, I would like to ask about your uh, career path. Um, uh, starting from your school days, how did you land up here? Sure. Uh, so I studied in Navanalanda School uh, in Calcutta, uh, same school as uh, our Koshik was there and. Also, you also no, 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 no. Yeah. So, so, so Koshik and I, we actually, we were actually classmates in uh, our uh, 11th and 12th standard. So after 12th standard, I uh, pursued uh, zoology uh, for my graduation from uh, Andrews College in uh, Calcutta University. And uh, after zoology, uh, I went to Forest Research Institute uh, in Dehradun in North India uh, to pursue masters in environmental management. And uh, after completing masters, uh, actually during the masters in the last semester, we had to do a dissertation project. So that I did from uh, Nature Conservation Foundation. It's a scientific okay. NGO uh, based in Mysore and Bangalore in South India. And uh, after masters, I joined uh, Nature Conservation Foundation as a research failure and developed uh, the idea for my PhD uh, with my uh, supervisor. Okay. And uh, ultimately, I registered with uh, the Wildlife Institute of India to okay. Saurashtra University. Uh, Wildlife Institute of India is again in Dehradun, and uh, did my PhD. Uh, basically, it was a collaboration between WII, Wildlife Institute, Nature Foundation, okay. uh, like a small leopard trust based okay. in Seattle, US. I see. So, okay. and after completing PhD in 2017, I submitted, and then. I took up a dual role in uh, the Ladakh program of uh, Nature Conservation Foundation as a program coordinator and uh, postdoctorate scholar. So, after completing my postdoctorate in 2018, I landed up uh, in my current job uh, with the United Nations Development Program and uh, the Ministry of Environment for Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, uh, next uh, I would like to ad ask for advice on something uh, apart from biology obviously. Uh, what other subjects do you have, need to be good at or have interest in? Uh, so in general, uh, one needs to have a scientific uh, bent of mind, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. So if, if somebody is interested in pursuing uh, academics, then uh, the ability to ask uh, questions and uh, the ability to uh, sort of find your way or figure your way through, uh, you know, a mess uh, to find your answer is very important. Uh, that's general. I mean, uh, it, it's across uh, every scientific uh, discipline, be it, be it chemistry, be it mathematics, be it biology. So, uh, Generally, I would say uh, these days the interdisciplinary thing is uh, uh, very well recognized and popular mm -hmm. uh, 
matter. So in that sense, one need not worry too much about exactly what background uh, or what subject uh, one needs to have. So we have uh, people coming from social sciences, we have people coming from uh, literature background, we have people coming in big time from the IT industry, yeah. uh, in the wildlife uh, science field, uh, mm -hmm. ecology field. Uh, but uh, say generally speaking, it is good if you have a background in one or the yeah. other biomedics uh, yeah. discipline, like say zoology mm -hmm. or say environmental science or botany. Uh, these days there are a lot of courses on uh, generally life sciences okay. uh, or ecology and conservation sort of mm -hmm. courses. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of universities in India uh, that are offering life sciences or zoology as uh, a graduation course. Yes. There are few universities which are offering environmental sciences, wildlife science, wildlife conservation, sustainability right. studies in the masters. Okay. Uh, so, and of course in uh, European countries and uh, UK, uh, yeah. particularly uh, US, uh, Australia, Japan, there are lots and lots of universities which are offering these. Sort of so overall I would say uh, you would have an approach if you are coming from a bioscience background, but it is not necessary. Not this field is uh, very abstract, so yeah. it's basically uh, it's dependent on your own ability to improvise mm -hmm. and uh, connect things. So, for example, one of my colleagues used to study religion, how okay. religion is impacting conservation of certain species, how certain species are reflected in religious folklore. So, mm -hmm. for example, in very uh, general terms in India, say foxes or wolves are usually portrayed as very cunning, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as, mm -hmm. as very uh, negative characters, yeah. whereas whereas species like say deer uh, mm -hmm. and wolves are portrayed in a very uh, sacred way, the sacred deer, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Of course, exactly. Yeah. Say peafowl, yeah, peafowl right. is another species which is considered, uh, you know, depicted in paintings, in artistry, poetry, etc. So all these uh, things even yeah, uh, yeah. considered from a societal point of view, mm. all these impact how these species are doing to this day. Yeah. Uh, how either respect them or not, that yeah. decides long term fate of a particular of species. Of their existence, yes. Okay, so you um, can study conservation from different yeah. angles. Exactly. So you have a live exactly. question actually from Sp uh, Spondon Basu. Yeah. So how so. tough the competition is in this field? Yeah, that's a very... <laughs> Good question. Right, right. So uh, overall, if you see, definitely this field is, uh, you know, the number of people. If I go into that term, is relatively very low because it is a, uh, it is a very uh, relatively very poorly ridden path. Uh, not many people usually come into this field. Uh, in India, particularly, you would see uh, generally a dominance of, uh, say, Bengalis, uh, hmm. Marathi, and uh, uh, you know, uh, say, I would say, people from southern Indian states like yeah. Tamil Nadu, and increasingly now from also Kerala, Karnataka, uh, okay. many people are coming in. And of course, I mean, I'm not saying that other states are, uh, yeah. you know, people from other states are not coming, but generally, if you look at uh, certain institutes, some of the yeah. major institutes like mm -hmm. wildlife institutes, like the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, like yes. the Indian Institute of Science, like the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, the ISERS. Yeah. Uh, there is really a preponderance of uh, uh, people from yeah. these regions. Uh, so in that sense, I would say we are a very small and uh, critically endangered bunch of uh, but uh, at the same time, the opportunities are also relatively low. The number of uh, universities or institutes offering courses are relatively low. And the yeah. number of, say, uh, big NGOs yeah. or big uh, institutes that can offer you a, a job opportunity after you complete your, say, graduation or post-graduation or even, say, PhD, they are relatively less as far as India is concerned. Mm, okay. Yeah. Relatively less. Uh, if you compare it with something like, say, the IT industry, which is right now 
uh, over the last say couple of decades uh, uh, has been mm. one of the biggest uh, industry in the country if you compare it yeah. with that then definitely uh, it's a very small uh, and, and focused field with a relatively low number of people with relatively low uh, opportunities or uh, avenues so in that sense it's a bit tricky and uh, uh, one needs to be really looking out for uh, the best opportunities one needs to be uh, very updated regarding the skills and also information and connect connection with a uh, lot of people absolutely so, yeah. yeah yeah um uh, moving on to the next question um can you give us some specific uh, institute names or options are available to study wildlife biology in the bachelors i would say those who are yeah, in class 12 and, how uh, would they yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> right so uh see it is not really advisable for someone to get into wildlife science or wildlife biology right after the plus 2 uh it's better if one gathers knowledge uh, from a relatively broader field uh, okay. say something like excuse me <coughs> something like uh, zoology something like environmental sciences something like life sciences mm-hmm. uh, it's better to have uh, you know knowledge uh, of different yeah. sub disciplines like say genetics yes. like immunology, like yeah. uh, say evolutionary biology like taxonomy uh, uh molecular biology itself uh, conformational yeah. cell yeah. molecular yeah. so uh, it's better to start broad uh, and then perhaps uh, narrow down a bit more in the post graduation mm. uh, so for graduation level i i mean there are bunch of uh, universities almost all uh, general uh, conventional universities they offer usually a course in zoology or life science or environment yes. yes okay so mm-hmm. one can get into any decent university say it might be delhi university it might be uh, jawaharlal nehru university it might be mumbai university it might be mysore yes. university mm-hmm. it might be calcutta university it might be guwahati university any say decent government yes. or private university one can get in masters uh, it becomes a bit more narrow uh, so i have myself done my masters from uh, forest research institute in environmental yeah. however there are uh, institutes like the wildlife institute of india the national center for biological sciences ncbs in bangalore yeah. uh, institutes like uh, kota university then uh, there is kerala agricultural university which are offering uh, masters in wildlife science wildlife conservation uh, sort of uh, subjects okay. and uh, then uh, there are again a handful of universities that offer you uh, a yeah. phd in uh, okay. wildlife yeah. mm-hmm. and of course in india uh, these are uh, some of the options that i mentioned yeah. uh, i IIC, IIC is a good place uh, in general to pursue ecological research. Yeah. Uh, Center for Ecological Sciences (CES) in okay. the Indian Institute of uh, Science in Bangalore. There are these uh, bunch of uh, ISERs, uh, Indian Institute of Science yeah. Education. Yes. Mm-hmm. There are uh, ISER in Mohali, in Tirupati, in uh, Kolkata, in Pune. Several uh, locations of ISERs. In Trivandrum, yeah. yeah, in Trivandrum. Yeah. So there are lots and lots of ISERs. Yeah. Uh, Bhopal, there is an ISER. So quite mm. a few. And usually, the uh, for universities, there are generally uh, entrance exams. Uh, uh, some of the institutes they carry out uh, national level exams, like the Wildlife Institute of India or NCBS. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for PhD also, you usually would. Uh, it's better if you have a, a national eligibility test, uh, NET, mm-hmm. uh, or. Uh, there are these uh, institute exams that you need to be uh, uh, qualifying and also there are quite a few uh, national level or international level scholarships I available see, okay. from the government like fulbright scholarship is there uh, commonwealth scholarship is there uh, to which uh, you need to come up with a proposal apply and compete uh, uh, you know in those uh, fellowships uh, to get into a uh, university in uh, say uk or us depending right. on which Uh, which uh, scholarship you are applying for and uh, abroad if i have to speak about uh, there are some fantastic uh, universities in uh, new zealand uh, mm-hmm. 
there are some wonderful universities in UK, uh, like Kent uh, University offers uh, yes. a and, uh, masters and PhD program. University yep. of Cambridge has a conservation leadership program. University of Oxford, uh, along with I think Wild Crew, uh, they have a, a masters and a PhD program. In the okay. US, there are a bunch of uh, universities starting right from the top ones: Yale, Stanford, right. uh, University of Minnesota, British Columbia, right. uh, University of California, uh, right. uh, California yeah. Davis. Texas University, Chicago in Canada, and there are uh, lots yeah, and lots lot of. So I think basically yeah. these things as a bachelor student well, while you are studying zoology or molecular biology yeah. or genetics, whatever it is, it's kind of your duty to be a bit aware of and regularly exactly. check the website exactly. of these colleges or universities exactly. as Obishek is suggesting yeah. uh, to be up to date and if you if you want to do a PhD in abroad, you also have to keep that in mind that maybe yeah. what the, there are chances for applying to grants or scholarships and these are not yeah. easy, you have to do a lot of other yeah, very extra, yeah. extra curricular yeah. activities as well apart than your yeah. studies so i'm sure you will yeah. uh, have a look at it and these uh, the, he mentioned a lot of specific institute names uh, even for the grants and scholarships so i hope this will be uh, uh, useful and actually in the video description link avishek's linkedin profile link is uh, pasted and he won a lot of grants and scholarships while he was studying so you can actually go there and check out the name of these specific institutes and specific grants or projects that he has done in past so that could be also a possibility um, yeah i was we, very fortunate yeah. <laughs> yes i saw from japan yeah, you've uh, you secured a grant from uk so these are very uh, yeah. interesting yeah 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 uh, yeah, so, also, uh, uh, yeah mm -hmm. speaking of uh, extracurricular activities so uh, is there any scope of internships right from the college or university level for students uh, in the uh, institutes that you have specifically mentioned uh, sure. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, there are uh, options of internships available almost in any decent-sized uh, NGO. So, for example, one of the biggest uh, NGO in India and also globally is WWF. They have a very strong uh, internship program. UNDP uh, are yeah. my own organization. Yeah. We have a, a very vibrant uh, internship program. Uh, uh, NGOs with which I have worked with, uh, say NCF, uh, institutes that I have worked with, say w, uh, WII, uh, they have they always uh, look out for uh, uh, volunteers, interns, for their mm -hmm. uh, helping out with their ongoing projects. Uh, also, during my own uh, graduation, I had uh, while in Calcutta, I had done internships in uh, uh, institutes like Indian Institute of Chemical Biology. In uh, uh, yeah, in cancer genetics, I had uh, done uh, internship just to learn how, uh, uh, say, uh, gel uh, electrolysis, uh, gel electrophoresis is done, how a PCR machine is done, how gene sequencing is done. So these are yeah. uh, important skills that one can uh, potentially pick up uh, by being associated with one of the other uh, lab or uh, NGO. Yeah. Because, see, getting into an internship program of a government thing or a government university might be difficult because uh, the informal setup is not much there. But at least in these uh, institutes, uh, one can uh, yeah. try getting into these internships. So okay. all, all big NGOs uh, and uh, institutes, they take in interns. Okay. One needs to write to them. One needs to basically look into the profiles of some of the scientists or researchers working in those uh, mm -hmm. NGOs match your interest with them and then you can yeah. write to them saying that I have say six months that I want to volunteer or intern. There are also paid paid internships. Paid internship, in, yeah. In mm -hmm. NGOs yeah. like uh, Wildlife Conservation Society for example, WCS. Okay. It's a US uh, headquartered NGO, very big time they are present in India. There is Center for Wildlife uh, Studies, CWS. There are NGOs uh, like Ashoka Trust, uh, so they always uh, they are always taking volunteers or interns uh, to help with their lot of projects. Yeah, I think so, uh, I have a question from the uh, viewers. Uh, uh, 
um, can uh, you Raj, give bad experiences? Uh, Raj, can I just when... interrupt you for a bit? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, I pasted the Quenas, I took the Quenas question, this question, I mean, uh, Abhishek had already answered yeah. that, but still I posted it. I would like to frame it a little bit different way because she asked that, can you face bad experience through days when you were researching on the Snow Leopard project? But I would like to ask that uh, since you have mentioned the conditions were harsh, you have to spend a lot of time on the field. What is, what would you say the average ratio of having a female uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. colleague or teammate or what is the how how your field actually welcome them especially a lot of field work right. is involved so yeah right right so uh, overall uh, see the presence of uh, uh, female colleagues uh, and in general uh, female researchers and scientists yes. uh, is very much there and uh, uh, you know they perform uh, I mean, in terms of uh, coping with the conditions and everything, I see, at least personally speaking, uh, mm -hmm. I differentiate in between uh, the two genders. Yeah. So, uh, of course, difficulties are there, uh, challenges are there. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the mental challenges of uh, spending a lot of time at those altitudes, mm -hmm. uh, say, maximum time that I had to spend would be above uh, 12,000 feet and yeah. uh, so the oxygen level of that area would be say 25, 30 to 40 percent less yeah. than you get in uh, the planes. So the mental and the physical stress in general is usually very high uh, yeah. in those yeah. when you're spending a lot of time in those areas. Yes. So you need to take a lot of care of yourself in terms of uh, keeping yourself hydrated uh, taking all the precautions related to high altitude sickness, yeah. for example, uh, you have to be on your toes regarding that. Yeah. Uh, in terms of day-to-day -day challenges, uh, uh, there are lots and lots of challenges. Like, mm -hmm. for example, uh, there are logistical challenges of reaching those areas. Yes. So, mm -hmm. Bangalore or Dehradun, when I used to travel, it used to take me two, two and a half days to just reach those. Reach there, yeah. Yeah. Conditions would be really bad at times. There would yeah. be landslides. There would be flash floods. Uh, yeah. There would be uh, risk of, uh, say, uh, you know, uh, snow uh, you know, yeah. avalanches. Uh, mm -hmm. There would be issues regarding availability of food at times mm -hmm. because they are closed. You wouldn't get fresh food supply for, uh, say, yeah. even weeks. Particularly during winter time, uh, if you are caught in a blizzard in a snow, snowstorm that might continue for three, four days, you are completely locked inside. By the time you are going out, you are, uh, the entire place is covered uh, under, say, you yeah. know, six, eight, ten feet of snow. Mm -hmm. uh, there are issues related to water supply. So usually you wouldn't have running water supply during the winter because water usually freezes. You have to depend on uh, underground water springs. Uh, two or three sources uh, of mm -hmm. uh, water springs are there in any village. So one needs to depend on that. So conditions are really, really challenging. Let me be yeah. very honest with that. And one needs to have the physical and mental aptitude yes. uh, ready to face and overcome these challenges. And yes. uh, along with these physical stress, of course, there are the issues of staying away from your family, away from your friends, away from your wife, uh, from your parents for a long, long time. So I had personally situations when I've lost uh, very close family relatives and I have not been in a position to uh, even go back and uh, see them for one last time. So so really tough. Uh, and, and as far as uh, women are concerned, they face the same sets of uh, problems. And again, as a woman, one needs to be ready to put up with these challenges. In terms of safety and all, uh, Contrary to the general views, you can sleep under the sky anywhere in the mountains. 99.9% uh, .9 you wouldn't have to be worried about any risk. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, That's no physical enough. risk, yeah, hardly any physical risk, hardly any mental risk or mm -hmm. mental harassment. But yes, at times the local community, because of their disposition, yeah. the way 
they interact with you can be yeah. uh, times a bit Literally, overwhelming yeah. what yeah. to be culturally you have to sort of give some time Blend to in to yeah, yeah exactly think with that yeah. Yeah. otherwise otherwise safety per se uh, nothing to worry about and uh, there are lots and lots of uh, yeah. fantastic women colleagues with whom i have worked in these areas for months spent time camp together in these areas put camera Perfect. traps on, yeah. on cliffs uh, yeah. in these areas uh, yeah. so so yeah i mean in so that to term, our uh, female uh, viewers i hope this is very assuring yeah you need to be fit you need to have the mindset of uh, culturally blending and all these things but uh, ultimately i hope at the end it's well, all worth it so taj yeah. maybe to the next question yeah um uh, if uh, someone uh, does not have a phd right after say bachelor's or master's degree uh, what are the job options available right so one thing i just would uh, mention up front one do not need to have a phd uh, it is only uh, one person's academic uh, say aspirations uh, because of which one might or might not pursue uh, a phd or post doctorate so it depends on what sort of uh, career you want to build so there are many colleagues of mine who are uh, say btech in computer science or btech in uh, say electronics uh, or btech in electrical engineering and they are uh pursuing a wonderful career in uh, in our field they are working as uh, say heads of programs or coordinators uh for uh, conservation wildlife conservation ngos uh so they have spent a lot of time so maybe they have uh, say 10 years or 12 years they have worked in an it company and then they have shifted to this field they have spent 5 6 7 8 years and then gradually they have climbed up the ladder uh immediately after bachelor's or master's say in a, a discipline like say zoology or life sciences uh, one can uh, get into any institute or ngo as a research affiliate or a program associate uh, position uh, in this field one thing that uh, one needs to keep in mind the salaries are usually not that great so uh, until and unless you are uh, you have a decent Uh, financial uh, support from your family mm-hmm. until unless you don't need to uh, support your uh, family financially big time yeah. uh, you should not uh, consider getting into this field it can uh, end up in lot of financial stress uh, let me be very honest about that yes. uh, yeah in any academia uh, it is given that in our country still now the stipends are in the range of say 30 35000 when you are okay. a jr and around say 35 40000 when you are uh, an srf senior okay. research fellow senior yeah. research fellow as you continue if you become a post doctorate scholar if you get a scholarship your stipend could be anywhere between 50 55000 to 80 85000 mm. mm-hmm. and then you can get a job at a relatively higher scale uh, yes. so it could yeah. be, uh, 80000 or 1 lakh you can start okay. uh, you have so having degrees uh, would actually help you start your career at a higher level higher level yeah. hmm. at a later stage uh, yes. say 6 7 years down the line but, all know uh, that right the phd exactly. sufferers <laughs> exactly so it's same it's same for any any academy yeah. that's why i said that if you are if you are not ready to pursue uh, phd or post doctorate no problem whatsoever you can finish your graduation you can yeah. finish your master and yeah. get into a program associate or research affiliate sort of a position start working there yeah. uh, you have to be ready to live with a relatively lower amount of uh, salary salary uh, you gain experience your uh, salaries and the scope of work also increases based on your yeah. uh, experience and based on your expertise yes yeah. okay uh, i think time is uh clicking <laughs> it's yeah, already sir. 55 minutes it's so we may minutes, uh, yeah. so um, just out of curiosity uh, what is your favorite animal i have yes. to ask <laughs> so uh, i would surprise you a bit uh, it's not so good uh, <laughs> actually uh, one of the one of the photos i have shared uh, it's the blue sheep or the varan uh, 
uh, it is one of the uh, uh, you know, in between uh, sheep and cow. Uh, it's basically called Fuda in Ayurveda, the scientific name. So it has the characteristics of a sheep as well as a goat, and usually the combination makes them one of the uh, most efficient uh, species that can uh, utilize the mountain habitat uh, in the best possible manner in terms of uh, getting food, in terms of uh, escaping their uh, predators like snow leopards and wolves, and uh, uh, you know climbing sheer cliffs. Uh, right like 90 degree walls uh, they can climb uh, without uh, so if you can uh, show uh, all our viewers what i'm talking about the uh, species uh, it's on i think the fourth or fifth slide uh, uh, we have the photo of the blue sheep and the next best uh, i would say is ibex again it's there in the presentation in the photo uh, it's a true goat uh, again uh, very regal with huge horns, uh, so I like the uh, wild herbivores because uh, you know the amount of effort, the yeah. amount of uh, expertise they need to develop to even eat a single blade of grass is yeah. mind. Yeah. And <laughs> the conditions through which they have to live are staggering, and, yes. and gives me the inspiration. Uh, to pursue this line, uh, so much we can learn from them. So much we can, uh, uh, you know, we can inspire yeah. ourselves with the characteristics and with the yeah. uh, with the skill sets that these animals have. Uh, yeah. It's just amazing, and that is why uh, these uh, species are uh, my favorite. Okay, so um, thank you, Abhishek. Uh, thanks a lot. You shared a lot of information with us, and it was actually very informative and enlightening for I hope for most of the students. This video will be, of course, recorded and be archived on our YouTube channel. You can come back and you can watch it anytime you want. Uh, sorry if we have some sound sound problem. Ashmita uh, Ashmita was mentioning. Sorry for that. We will try to uh, better it. Uh, for the, from the next sessions um, uh, and the questions that I still have some questions on my list actually Obishak's field itself is so much interesting I had a lot of questions on environmental science and climate change but unfortunately it's been already an hour but I hope we will come back with a feature article maybe on Ob Obishak's questions and also you guys feel free to drop your uh, questions in the comment box I will personally reach out to Obishak after this session and he will be answering your questions and we will probably release another short article on him answering all your questions but let's see how we are into it so thank you abhishek sure. and have a wonderful thank so night yeah. thank you all the uh, all the student representatives of mentor views and Moita, you yourself for organizing this uh, session yeah. and allowing an opportunity to speak to our viewers Absolutely. thank you so much yeah be in just touch be with, with us yeah. Yeah. thank you um okay guys so we will be ending this session sorry it took a little bit longer but a lot of interesting stories right and uh, again yeah. sorry for the sound quality uh, mm -hmm. i mean i cannot guarantee every one of uh, speakers and headphones of course uh, but the thing is uh, i would like to mention one thing just like today's session uh, we are trying to reach out to many students as many students as possible uh, we are trying to connect with colleges we are trying to connect with schools different professionals are coming in our uh, upcoming sessions and this is for you guys and i would like to personally ask you that please reach out with your questions whatever questions you have uh, please just write us an email we will be uh, personally on your behalf reach out to these professionals and we will be get back to you so uh, don't hesitate i know many of us feel a little bit shy or a little bit hesitant in writing questions in the live chat box but be like Taj. you see he's just a 12 uh, class 12 pass out students but still uh, he's here uh, kind of hosting this session so uh, i i we really encourage that and uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
you will find the infos of our social media pages or just simply write an email at info at, the, uh, at mentorviews.org and we will come back to you. And if you have uh, any yeah. leads on on how to reach your college or if you want us to reach to you through your school sections or colleges section or university section and want to listen about a certain profession also mention to mention it in the comment box or reach out to us we promise that we will try to arrange those sessions with you guys um, yeah, as quickly uh, as possible also uh, to the students please uh, feel free to get your friends involved as the sessions are so interesting so i think um, your friends would also like to uh, be a part of these live streams and as mentioned before uh, do check out our uh, social media pages uh, feel free to uh, drop any questions in our maybe our instagram or our email id wherever you want and uh, yeah that's it i think yeah and again for any questions you have specific for abhishek on related to environmental science climate change wildlife science uh, do drop that. Uh, I know many of the questions even I missed uh, asking due, due to time constraints and I, I would love to uh, hear about uh, his feedback on that and we are trying to maybe write a future article and maybe some one of you who have interest in uh, science journalism just join us and you do a future article on him. Why not, right? So until then, um uh, stay tuned subscribe our channels these things that we have to say uh but uh, yeah check out our pages uh, regularly and until our next sessions bye bye have a good night yeah like and subscribe yes